Lecture 4, Word Music and Translation Ladies and gentlemen, for the sake of clarity, I shall confine myself tonight to the problem of verse translation, a minor problem, but also a very relevant one. And this lecture should pave us away to the topic of my forthcoming lecture, word music, perhaps word magic, sense and sound in poetry. According to a widely held superstition, all translations betray their matchless originals. This is eked out by the well-known, the two well-known Italian pun, traduttore et traditore, and is supposed to be unanswerable. Now, since this pun is very popular, I suppose there must be a kernel of truth, a core of truth hidden somewhere in it. And we will go into the discussion of the possibilities, or otherwise, the success, or otherwise, of verse. It's a translation. And according to my habit, I'll begin by a few examples. I don't think any discussion can be carried on without examples. And as my memory is sometimes quite akin to oblivion, I, I, I shall choose brief examples, since it would be beyond our time and my capacity to analyze stanzas or poems. Now, we will begin by, by the Ode of Runenburg and Tennyson's translation. This Ode, if what my dates are always rather shaky, was composed at the beginning of the 10th century. It was written or composed to celebrate a victory of the Wessex men against the, the Dublin Vikings, the Scotsmen, and the Welsh. And we will go into the examination of a verse or so. In the original, we find something that runs more or less like this. Zunne up on Morian Tid, Mere Tungal. That is to say, the sun at morning tide or at morning time, and then that famous star, or that mighty star, but famous is, of course, a better translation, Mere Tungal. And then the poet goes on to speak of the sun as Godes Kondel Beorcht, the bright candle of God. Now, this ode, was it had done into English prose by Tennyson's son. It was published in a magazine, and you may suppose that Mr. Tennyson had some essentials of old English verse explained to him by his son. His son may have explained about the beat of the old English verse, about the alliterations instead of the rhymes, and so on. And then Tennyson, who was very fond of experiments, tried his hand at writing old English verse in modern English. And it is noteworthy to remark that though the experiment was quite successful, he never came back to it again. So that if we had to look for old English verse in Lord Alfred Tennyson's works, we should have to be content with that one outstanding example of the Ode of Runenburg. Well, we have already seen those two fragments, the sun, that famous star, or the famous star, and later on, the sun, the bright candle of God, Godes Konden, Beorcht. And when Tennyson came to that particular line, he translated it thus, when first the great 
Sun, star of morning tide. Now, sun, star of morning tide is, I think, a very striking translation. It is even more Saxon than the Saxons, since we have those two compound Germanic words, sun, star of morning tide. And of course, though the word morning tide can be easily explained as morning time, we are also we may also think that Tennyson wanted to suggest to us the image of the dawn as overflowing the sky. So that we have this very strange verse. For when first the great sun star of morning tide, and then a verse or so later, when Tennyson comes to the bright candle of God, he translates it as, as the, the lamp of the Lord. And we will now take another example of a, of a, not only of a blameless, but of a fine translation. And this time we shall consider a translation from the Spanish. It is the wonderful poem Noche Oscura del Alma. Dark Night of the Soul, written in the 16th century by one of the greatest, we may safely say, the greatest of Spanish poets, of all men who were used the Spanish language for the purposes of poetry. I'm speaking, of course, of San Juan de la Cruz. And the first stanza runs thus. En una noche oscura, con ansias en amores inflamada, oh dichosa aventura, salí sin ser notada, estando ya mi casa sosegada. Now, this stanza is, of course, a wonderful stanza. But if we consider the last verse, it is taken by itself, torn from its context, and of course, we are not allowed to do that. It is an undistinguished verse. We have, estando ya mi casa sosegada, when my house was quiet, and then we have the rather hissing sound of the three S's, mi casa sose, and then sosegada is hardly a striking word. I am not trying to disparage the text. I am merely pointing out, and in a short time you will see why I am doing this, I'm trying to point out that the verse taken by itself, torn from the context, as I said, is unremarkable. And now, this poem was translated into English by Arthur Simons, I think, at the end of the last century. The translation is not a good one, but if you care to look at it, you may find it in Yeats' Oxford book of uh, modern verse. And Some years ago, a great Scottish poet, who was also a South African, Roy Campbell, attempted a translation of The Dark Night of the Soul. Now, I wish I had the book by me, but we will confine ourselves to the verse I have just quoted. Estando ya mi casa sosegada. And we'll see what Roy Campbell made of it. He translated it thus, when all my house was hushed. And there you have the word all that gives a sense of space, a sense of vastness to the lines. And then the beautiful, the lovely English word hushed. Hushed seems to give us somehow the very music of silence. Now, I have taken those two very favorable examples of the art of translation, and I will add to them a third one. This I will not discuss, since it is not a case of verse rendered into verse, but rather of prose being lifted up into verse, into poetry. We have that common Latin tag, done from the Greek, of course, 
Ars longa vita brevis. Or, as I suppose you also pronounce it, vita brevis. Now, this is of course very ugly, and let us go back to vita brevis, and let us go back to Virgil and not to Vergilius, no? <laughs> well, here we have a plain statement, a statement of an opinion. This is quite plain sailing, this is straightforward, it strikes no deep chord. In fact, it is a kind of prophecy of the telegram and of the literature evolved by it. So that we have art is long, life is short. And this tag was repeated over ever so many times, and then we come to the 14th century, and then un grand translateur, a great translator, Master Geoffrey Chaucer, needed that verse. Of course, he wasn't thinking about medicine. He was thinking perhaps about poetry, or perhaps the text is not by me, so we can choose. Perhaps you're thinking of love, and he wanted to work in those, that line, and then he wrote, the life so short, the craft so long to learn, or, as you may suppose, he pronounced it, the life so short, the craft so long to learn. And there we get not only the statement, but we also get the very music of wistfulness. We can see that the poet is not merely thinking of the art was art and of the brevity of life, but that he's also feeling it. And of course, this is given by the apparently invisible, inaudible key word, the word so, the leaf so short, the craft so long to learn. And now let us go back to two examples. The example of the famous ode of Runenburg and Tennyson, and the example of the Noche of Cura del Alma and San Juan de la Cruz. Now, if we consider the two translations I have quoted verbally, then they are, I should say, not inferior to the originals. And yet, we feel that there is a difference. And the difference is beyond what a translator can do. It depends rather on the way we read poetry. For if we look back on the ode of Runenburg, then we know that the ode, that the ode came from deep emotion. We know that the Saxons had been beaten many times over by the Danes, that they hated this, and we must have thought, we must think of the joy the Saxons, the West Saxons felt when, after a long day's struggle, the Battle of Brunenburg was one of the greatest in the medieval history of England, when, after a day's struggle, they defeated Olaf, the king of the Dublin Vikings, and the hated Scotsman, and the Welshman. We may think of what they felt. We may think of the man who wrote the ode. Perhaps he was a monk. The fact remains that instead of thanking God in the orthodox fashion, he thanked the sword of his king and the sword of Prince Edmund for the victory. He does not say that God vouchsafed the victory to them. He says that they won it Swarda Edgium, by the edge of their swords. And the whole poem is filled with a fierce, ruthless joy. He mocks at those who have been defeated. He is very happy that, that they have been defeated. He talks of the king and his brother going back to their own Wessex, their own West Saxon land, as Tennyson has it. And he says, they returned to old West Saxon land, glad of the war. And then after that, he 
goes back to the past of English history. He thinks of the men who came over from Jutland under Hengist and Horsa. And this is very strange because I do not suppose many men had that historical sense in the Middle Ages. So that we have to think of the, of the poem as coming out of a deep emotion. We have to think of it as the kind of onrush of great verse. And then when we come to Tennyson's version, much as we may admire it, and I knew it before I knew the Saxon original, we think of it as a successful experiment in Old English verse wrought by a master of modern English verse. That is to say, the context is different. And of course, the translator is not to be blamed for this. And the same thing happens in the case of San Juan de la Cruz and Roy Campbell. We may think, I suppose we're allowed to think, that when all my house was hushed is verbally, from the point of view of literature, from the point of view of, view of mere literature, superior to estando ya mi casa sosegada. But that is of no avail as regards our judgment of the two pieces, of the Spanish original and of the English rendering. Because in the first case, we think of San Juan de la Cruz. We think that he reached somehow the highest experience of which the soul of a man is capable, the experience of ecstasy, the blending together of a human soul to the soul of divinity, to the soul of the Godhead, of God. And then, after he had had that unutterable experience, he had to communicate it somehow in metaphors. And then he found ready to his hand the song of songs. And he took, many mystics have done this, he took the image of sexual love as an image for the mystic union between man and his God. And he wrote the poem. And thus we are hearing, we are overhearing, we may say, as in the case of Saxon, the very words that, that he uttered. And then we come to Roy Campbell's translation. We find it good, but we are apt to say, or to think perhaps, that well, of course, the Scotsman made, after all, quite a good job of it. But this, of course, is, is different. That is to say, the difference between a translation and the original is not a difference in the text themselves. I suppose if we did not know whether one was original and the other translation, we could judge them fairly. But unhappily, we cannot do this. And so the translator's work is always supposed to be inferior, or what is worse, is felt to be inferior, even though verbally one may be, the, the, the rendering may be as good as the text. Now, leaving this for the moment, we'll come to another problem, the problem of a literal translation. Of course, when I speak of literal translations, I am using a wild metaphor, since if a translation cannot be true word to word to its original, it can still less be true letter to letter. Now, in the 19th century, a quite forgotten Greek scholar, Newman, attempted a hexameter literal translation of Homer. It was his purpose to publish a translation let us say, against Pope's Homer. And so he used, he used words such as wet waves, wine dark sea, and so on. Now, Mr. Matthew Arnold had his own theories on translating Homer. And when Mr. Newman's book 
came out, he reviewed it, Newman answered him, Matthew Arnold answered back, and in the essays of Matthew Arnold, you can read that very lively and very intelligent discussion, since both men had much to say on the two sides of the question. Newman supposed that literal translation was the most faithful one. And Matthew Arnold began by a theory about Homer. He said that in Homer, several qualities were to be found. Those qualities were clarity, nobility, simplicity, and so on. And he thought that the translator should always convey the impression of those qualities, even when the text did not bear him out. Now, Matthew Arnold pointed out that a literal translation made for oddity and for uncouthness. For example, in, in the Romance languages, we do not say it is cold, but it makes cold. Il fait froid, il fait froid fa freddo, hace frío, and so on. Yet, I don't think anybody should translate it's cold by... No, it, 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 it should translate il fait froid for it makes cold. Or, for example, in English, one should say good morning. And in Spanish, one should say buenos días, good days. And yet, if good morning should be translated as buena mañana, then we should feel that this is a literal translation, but hardly a true one. Now, Matthew Arnold pointed out that if a text be translated literally, then false emphasis are created. I do not know whether he came across, perhaps rather it was too late, he came across Captain Burton's translation of the Arabian Nights. For Burton translates Kita Balflaila Walaila as book of the thousand nights and a night, instead of book of the thousand and one nights. Now this translation is a literal one. It is true word by word to the Arabic. But yet it is false in the sense that the words book of the thousand nights and a night are common form in Arabic. While in English, they, it, while in English, we have a slight, a slight shock of surprise. And this, of course, has not been intended by the original. Now, Matthew Arnold advised a translator of Homer to have the Bible at his elbow. He said that Bible English might be a kind of standard to the translation of Homer. And yet, if Matthew Arnold had looked closely into his Bible, he might have seen that the English Bible is full of literal translations, and that part of the beauty, of the great beauty of the English Bible lies in those literal translations. For example, in the English Bible we have a tower of strength. Now this is a sentence translated, I suppose, by Luther as a infeste burg, a mighty or a firm stronghold. And then we have the song of songs. Now, I read in Fray Luis de Leon that the Hebrews had no superlative, so that they could not say the highest song or the best song. So they said the song of songs, even as they might have said the king of kings not the emperor, but the highest king, or the moon of moons, the highest moon, or the night of nights, the most hallowed of nights. Now, if we compare the English rendering, Song of Songs, to the German by Luther, we see that Luther, who had no care for beauty, Luther, who merely wanted his Germans to understand the text, translated it as das Hohelied, 
the high lay. And so we find that these two literal translations make for beauty. In fact, it might be said that literal translations make not only, as Matthew Arnold pointed out, for uncouthness and oddity, but also for strangeness and beauty. And this, I think, is felt by all of us. For if we look into a literal version of some outlandish poem, then we expect something strange. If we do not find it, we feel somehow disappointed. And now we come to one of the finest, one of the most famous English translations. I am speaking, of course, of Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat of Omar Hayyam. Now, the first stanza runs thus. Awake, for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight, and lo, the hunter of the east has caught the sultan's turret in a noose of light. Now, as we know, the book was discovered in a bookstall by Swinburne and Rossetti, and they were overwhelmed by his beauty. They knew nothing whatever of Edward Gerald. He was a quite unknown man of letters. He had tried his hand at translating Calderon and Fariduddin Satar's Parliament of Birds. These books were not too good. And then there came this famous book, now a classic. Now he said that Rossetti and Swinburne felt the beauty of the translation. And yet, we wonder if they would have felt this beauty had Fitzgerald presented the Rubaiyat as an original. Partly it was an original and not as a translation. Would I think Fitzgerald have been allowed to say, awake for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight? This second verse sends us to a footnote and there it is explained that that to fling a stone into a bowl is a sign for the parting of the caravan. And then I wonder where Fitzgerald would have been allowed the news of light and the Sultan's turret in a poem of his own. But I think that we can safely dwell on a single line. The line is to be found in one of the other stanzas, and it runs thus. Dreaming when dawn's left hand was in the sky, I heard a voice within the tavern cry, Awake, my little ones, and fill the cup before life's liquor in his cup be dry. We may dwell, I suppose, on the first line. Dreaming when dawn's left hand was in the sky. Of course, the key word in that line is the word left. Had any other adjective been used, the line would be meaningless. But left hand makes us think of something strange, of something sinister. We know that the right hand is associated with right, with the word righteousness, direct, and so on, while we have the ominous word left. Let me remember in Spanish, lanzada de moro izquierdo que atraviese el corazón. The idea of something sinister, something and we feel there is something subtly wrong about Dawn's left hand. If the Persian was dreaming when Dawn's left hand was in the sky, then his dream may become a nightmare at any moment. And of this, we are slightly aware. We don't have to dwell on the word left, but the word left makes all the difference. So delicate and so mysterious is the art of verse. Now, we accept dreaming when dawn's left hand was in the sky because we suppose that there is a Persian original behind it. As far as I'm aware, Omar Hayyam does not bear Fitzgerald out. And this brings us to an interesting problem. The problem that 
a literal translation has created a beauty all of its own. And I have always wondered about the origin of literal translations. Nowadays, we are fond of literal translations. In fact, many of us only accept literal translations because we want to give every man his due. That would have seemed a crib to them. They were thinking of something far worthier. They wanted to prove that the vernacular was as capable of a great poem as the original. And I suppose that Don Juan de Jauregui, when he rendered Lucan into Spanish, thought of that also. And I don't think any contemporary of Pope thought about Homer and Pope. I suppose that the readers, the best readers anyhow, thought of the poem in itself. They were interested in the Iliad, in the Odyssey, and they had no care for verbal, if the trifles. Now, all throughout the Middle Ages, people thought of translation, not in terms of a literal rendering, but in terms of something being recreated, of a poet having read a work and then somehow evolving that work from himself, from his own might, from the possibilities, hitherto known, of his language. And how did the literal translations begin? I do not think they came out of scholarship. I do not think they came out of scruples. I think they had a theological origin. For though people would think of Homer as the greatest of poets, still they knew that Homer was human, quandoque dormitat bonus homerus, and so on, and so they could reshape his words. But when it came to translating the Bible, that was something quite different, because the Bible was supposed to have been written by the Holy Ghost. And if we think of the Holy Ghost, if we think of the infinite intelligence of God undertaking a literary task, then we are not allowed to think of any chance elements, of any haphazard elements in his work. No, if God writes a book, if God condescends to literature, then every word, every letter, as the Kabbalist said, must have been thought out. And it might be blasphemy to tamper with a text written by an endless, by an eternal intelligence. And thus, I think, the idea of a literal translation came from the translations of the Bible. This is merely my guess. I suppose there are many scholars here who, can, who may correct me if I make a mistake, but I think that this is highly probable. And then when very fine translations of the Bible were undertaken, men began to discover, began to feel that there was a beauty in alien ways of expression. And now everybody likes, everybody's fond of literal translations because a literal translation always gives us those small jolts of surprise that we expect. And in fact, it might be said that perhaps no original is needed. Perhaps a time will come when a translation will be considered as something in itself. We may think of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnets from the Portuguese. Sometimes I have attempted a rather bold metaphor. Then I have seen that nobody would accept it if it came from me. I am a mere contemporary. And then I have attributed it to some out of the way Persian or Norseman. <laughs> and then my friends have said it's quite fine. And of course, I have never told them that I had invented it because I was fond of the metaphor. And after all, the Persians and the Norsemen may have invented that metaphor or, or far better ones. 
Thus, we go back to what I said at the beginning, that the fact that a translation is never judged verbally. It should be judged verbally, but it never is. For example, and I hope you won't think that I'm uttering a blasphemy, I have looked very carefully, but this was some 40 years ago, and now I can plead the mistakes of youth. I have looked into Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal and into Stefan Georges Blumen, des Bösen. And I think that Baudelaire was, of course, a greater poet than Stefan Georges. But Stefan Georges was a far more skillful craftsman. And so I think that if we compare them line by line, we should find Stefan Georges Umdichtung. This is a fine German word. It means not a poem translated from another, but a poem, let's say, woven around another. And we also have Nachdichtung, an after poem, a translation, and then the mere translation, Übersetzung. I think that Stefan Georges' translation is perhaps better than Baudelaire's book. But of course, this will do Stefan Georges no good, since people who are interested in Baudelaire, and I have been very much interested in Baudelaire, think of his words as coming from him. That you say, the thing of the context of his whole life. While in the case of Stefan Georges, we have an efficient, but a rather priggish 20th century poet turning Baudelaire's very words into an alien language, into German. Now I have spoken of the present. I say that we are burdened, overburdened by historical sense. We cannot look into an ancient text as the men of the Middle Ages or of the Renaissance or even of the 18th century did. No, we are worried by circumstances. We want to know exactly what Homer meant when he wrote about the wine dark sea. If wine dark sea be the right translation, I do not know. But if we are historically minded, I think we may perhaps suppose that a time will come when men will no longer be as aware of history as we are. A time will come when men shall care very little about the accidents and circumstances of beauty. They shall care for beauty itself. Perhaps they shall not even care about the names or the biographies or the poets. That is all to the good. We may think that there are whole nations who think in this way. For example, I do not think in India people have a historical sense. One of the great, one of the thorns in the flesh for Europeans who write, who have written histories of Indian philosophy, is that all philosophy is treated as contemporary by the Indians. That is to say, they are interested in the problems themselves, not in the mere biographical fact or chronological fact that so and so was, what's his name's master, that he came before, that he wrote under that influence. All these things are nothing to them. They care about the riddle of the universe. And I suppose in a time to come, and I hope this time is around the door, in a time to come, men will care for beauty, not from the circumstances of beauty. And then we will have translations, not only as good, because maybe we have them already, but as famous as Chapman's Homer, as Earl Charles Rabelais, as Pope's Odyssey. And I think that this is a consummation devoutly to be wished for.